Well, good morning, church. It is great to be together. And um, I realized this morning that I am wearing the exact same outfit I wore after uh, we won the Alabama game. And I'm not sure if I'm wearing that just to kind of re recover those happy memories from three weeks ago or not. I don't know. But anyways, there we are. Um, we're glad you're here today. My name's Ethan, one of the ministers here. And if you're a guest with us, you're in the right place. And uh, we're launching a new series this week. It's a real short series, How to Share Your Fries. It's going to take us uh, just through Thanksgiving. Um, but in some ways, it's a continuation of the series we just finished. We just finished a sermon series called Life in exile. Uh, if you missed it, I, I just want to say um, we got a lot of really uh, important feedback from people that it was a really helpful series for them spiritually. So if you missed it, you might want to go back and check it out online. Uh, the whole series that we just finished was built on the acknowledgement that if we are trying to pattern our lives after Jesus, if we're trying to follow Jesus with our life, then we will regularly discover that we are walking in a different direction than everybody else around us. If we're trying to walk after Jesus, we'll be walking one way and everybody else will be walking uh, a different way. Um, we, we, we learned, uh, we looked at these characters from the exile. We discovered that, that obedience to God, while it ultimately leads to the promise of God's blessing, in the short run, it often leads on a journey of suffering and challenge. We looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who, who believed God would save them, but they said, even if he doesn't, we will not bend the knee or worship other gods. And um, a lot of people, I got, I got notes, I got comments, I got emails, and people stopped me in the hall. And they said, I needed that reminder that following Jesus is to walk in a different direction than following the world. And last week was sort of an illustration of that. Leroy was here. He talked about loving one another, even in an election year. And I just, this last week, I just noticed, yeah, that really is a different direction than the way everybody else is going. Man, if we go that way, if we love people, even those we disagree with about politics, we will be walking in a different direction than everybody else. And this series is, is like that too. You could sort of think of these next three weeks as sort of an illustration of the principles that we established in the Life in Exile series. We're talking about an area of our spiritual walk, an area of our discipleship, where if we are following Jesus, we will be walking in a different direction from everybody else. In fact, we'll even often be walking in a different direction than the one we wanted to walk. We're talking in this series, uh, not just about French fries, but about how to share everything we have. How is it that God wants us to manage our money and oversee our finances? What does God's word have to say about your wallet? Now, I want to talk a little bit about the, the motivation for this series. Uh, the motivation for a series like this is not uh, to fund the church budget. It is true, of course, that our giving does fund the church budget, and every year there are, th are mission-critical opportunities that we can't take because the money isn't there. That, that's all true. But honestly, we trust God for that. And, and this series, we put on the calendar months ago, like 18 months ago, before we knew whether this would be a good economic year or a bad economic year or anything like that, because we don't talk about this just to fund the budget. We talk about it because it's one of those areas where if we're following Jesus, we will be walking in a different direction than the one everybody else walks. And if we don't stop and talk about it every once in a while, we can get turned around so easily. We talk about it because there's a lot of confusion and pain about money. Families fight about money. People wonder about money. What should I do with my money? How much money should I have? How much money should I keep? How much money should I give away? We talk about it because Jesus talked about it. Those of you who haven't read much of the Bible, you might be surprised to discover, given that Jesus was a holy man and all, that, that he actually talked about money a lot. One of his most common topics was to call people to a different way of approaching their wealth. 
because Jesus knew that there are ways of approaching our wealth that lead to selfishness and self-destruction and pain, and there are ways that lead to blessing. And what we discover when we study Jesus long enough, what we, what we discover about Jesus is that whenever Jesus emphasizes obedience, it is always so that he can bless us. Whenever Jesus makes a big deal about obedience, it's because Jesus knows this is an area where obedience leads to blessing and disobedience leads to suffering and Jesus is trying to protect us. We also talk about it, and this is maybe the main thing I hope you discover over these next three weeks, is that there is an opportunity for real spiritual growth and real spiritual freedom if we will listen to what God's word has to teach us in this area. So maybe it's not your favorite series. Maybe it's one of these places where you'd rather just walk the same direction everybody else is walking. I get that. But we need it. And God's word has some wisdom for us. So let's talk about French fries. Uh, the story about the fries, for me, starts in 2006 or 2007. I, I heard a preacher use a sermon illustration, one of these first-person stories about him and his kid, and it was gold. Like, this story, it was killer. I'm like, oh my goodness, I am totally using that in sermons for the rest of my life. I love that illustration. But it was a little stronger because it was a first person story. Like, because, it, you, know, you know, it was stronger because it had happened to him, right? But that's no problem for me. I'm just going to reenact it, right? And then it will have happened to me as well. I can't remember where I heard the illustration. It was off at a conference or something at some event like that. I hear this story. But as soon as I get home, I take one of my kids to McDonald's. I can't even remember which one it was. Uh, you know, it could have been, given the time period, it could have been either one. They both would have been about the right ages. I don't even remember who it was. But I took one of my boys to McDonald's. And I, I've set up this whole thing because I, I need the sermon illustration that I'm about to give you, right? So the whole thing is staged, right? I tell him to go over and sit in one of the booths and I'm going to go buy us lunch, I know what he was eating at the time. His main thing at McDonald's was uh, cheeseburgers at the time. My main thing at McDonald's then and now was a Big Mac. So I get him a cheeseburger and I get him a Big Mac and I buy the largest fry they sell at McDonald's. Some of you don't even know that the extra large fry is not their largest fry. They sell it in a basket. Man, see, that's, some of you, that's why God brought you to church today, was so you could learn that bit of good news. The McDonald's sells their fries in baskets. Okay, anyway, so we buy the largest fry McDonald's sells, cheeseburger Big Mac, the largest fry they sell. I walk back to the table. I set the cheeseburger in front of him. I set the Big Mac on the other side of the booth there, and I set the fries right next to his cheeseburger. He looks at me, this huge basket of fries. I sit down across the table, and the first thing I do is reach over and grab some fries. And he says, as if I had trained him to say it, Dad, quit eating my fries. Why are you eating my fries? And I was like, yes, it worked. I've got my illustration. Boom, I was done for the day, right? I love this story. I loved it when I first heard it. I loved, I loved the actual experience of it. I love retelling it now because that's insane, right? Nathan Hall told me his dad did the same thing to him when he was a little boy, also for a sermon illustration. That's how reliable this thing is. If you want to try it with your kids, it is that reliable. And, and, and we laugh when we hear the story and we laugh when we tell the story. I laughed in the moment of the story because the kid's reaction in that moment is so foolish. Where do they think they got those fries? I literally just put the fries in front of them. It's the biggest order of McDonald's fries he's ever seen in his life. If by some miracle he were to eat all the fries, I am right there. I'm the one with the wallet. I could walk back up to the counter, buy more fries, and bring them to our table. Yet even under those conditions, 
me having just given him the fries, me being the obvious provider of the fries, me being the one who is capable of supplying more fries if the fries were to run out, even under those conditions. It takes exactly three seconds of those fries sitting next to his cheeseburger for him to be like, Dad, quit eating my fries. Now, don't worry. My children have been well-trained since then. They understand all fried potatoes are to be shared with their father in any quantity at all times. So we've figured that we've worked that. The parenting piece has been worked out. But, uh, but I got my sermon illustration. And it was mostly funny. But it was just a little bit heartbreaking. Because some little part of me had imagined that it might not work. Some little part of me, I mean, mostly I wanted my sermon illustration and I got it, great. But some little part of me wanted my little kid to value the relationship with me more than the fries. Some little part of me wanted him to be like, sure, eat all you want. Let's share some fries together, Dad. Let's just sit here and eat some fries. I got the illustration that I wanted, and I'm going to, you know, milk it for all it's worth over the next three weeks. But I was a little brokenhearted. I would have rather shared fries with my, I don't know, what was he, three, four, five, six, something like that. I would rather shared fries with my little kid and never gotten the illustration. I think back at that story. It's just a little bit silly and a little bit heartbreaking. And I think that is the best way I could describe the way our world teaches us to approach our money. A little bit silly and a little bit heartbreaking. In fact, probably any time that we follow the pattern of the world and ignore the pattern of God, it's some ratio of silly and heartbreaking. Only a fool would ignore the wisdom of God. That's the silly part. But when we do ignore the wisdom of God, it damages our relationship with God. That's the heartbreaking part. So just like my kids had to learn to grow up and share their fries with their dad, and I promise you they all have, we as God's children need to learn how to share our fries. And so for the next three weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. How do you share your fries? We're going to lay some groundwork this week. This week's going to be a pretty teachy, a lot to explain, so you'll make it through. Because there's some things we need to understand about the way the universe works to prepare us to share our fries the way God wants us to share our fries. I mean, for starters, you got to know this. Everything belongs to God. Everything. You don't even have any fries. Those were my fries the whole time. Those were not my kids' fries. They were my fries. I bought those fries. I paid those fries. I put them down on the table. I could have picked them up. Those were my fries. Everything belongs to God. Psalm 24 starts this way. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everything belongs to God. It's God's wallet, God's credit card, God's house, God's 401k. I belong to God. You belong to God. Everything I have belongs to God and has been provided by God. Remembering this is a a good first step to being ready to share your fries. It's always easier to share somebody else's stuff, right, than it is to share your own stuff. You know, giving away my money is hard, but I could give away your money super easy. That'd be no problem for me at all. That'd be, that'd be easy. But when I tried it with my kid, isn't it fascinating how quickly he forgot that the fries belonged to me? Like instantly, he, as soon as I set him down, two seconds later, I'm sitting down and reach across, he's forgotten who's the provider, the owner of that fries. 
And we do the same thing with our wealth. We say, I earned that money, I saved that money, I inherited that money, I worked for that money, that money has my name on it, therefore it is my money, it's my house, it's my wallet, my car. And to this, God just keeps speaking very clearly. The way God speaks about God's ownership of everything is super clear and consistent in Scripture. We get texts like this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. You may say to yourself, and boy, I'm just telling you, this this sentence sounds familiar to every single one of us. Nothing about this sentence sounds weird to us. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. God says, not only do I own everything and provide everything and everything belongs to me, even the illusion that you could work hard and produce wealth for yourself confuses you because even that is a gift from me. If you got a paycheck recently in your life, thank God. God is the one who gave you the ability and the opportunity. God did that, not you. It might sting a little bit to hear that, but don't take it personally because it's true for everybody. But it is personal, right? The, the, The recognition that everything that I think belongs to me, in fact, belongs to God. I warned you that this would be one of these series where we discover that if you're trying to follow Jesus, you're just going to be walking in a different direction than everybody else. I mean, we're already there, right? Nobody thinks this way. The the spirit of our age teaches us very clearly, if it belongs to you, if it belongs to you. And Jesus says, no, it belongs to God. Really, the, 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 the philosophy of finance that our world gives us is not that much different than my kid with his french fries there at the table. It's why I wanted to reenact the sermon illustration so much. Just as soon as I set it down, he's like, I guess these are mine. And this is what we do. If I have it, it must be mine. If it's in my bank account, it must be my money. If it's in my house, it must be my stuff. If I earned it, it's mine. If I own it, it's mine. If I inherit it, it's mine. And into that culture and that moment and that mindset, God just says, "Um, actually, uh, it's mine. And that's lesson one. God owns the fries and provides the fries to us. If you wanted to say this in really theological language, you could put it like this. Every fry God provides. This is how the theologians put this concept. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so lesson one is just God owns all the fries. And lesson two uh, in the theological foundation that helps us understand how to share our fries, lesson two just flows right from that. If God is the owner of all the fries, then it's reasonable to ask, well, what is my relationship to these fries? Because they are in my bank account, after all, and they're accessed via my checkbook, and I I log into my online account. I mean, so I have some relationship to this basket of fries that just got placed before me. Well, the Bible actually has a word for what our relationship is. The Bible says that we are stewards of the fries. Had this illustration failed, 
That's what my son would have known. He didn't own the fries. He was just in charge of the fries. In charge of sharing the fries with his dad. A a steward in this context is the chief servant of the household. They were the one that was in charge of everything, in charge of all the other servants, in charge of all the stuff, in charge of all the land, in charge of all the buildings, in charge of all the cattle, in charge of all the wealth. And their job was to manage the household in accordance to the master's design. And Jesus teaches us In fact, it's one of his most popular parable topics. You go look at the parables of Jesus. There are a few themes that pop up over and over again. But one of the most frequent themes is this idea that we are stewards of God's stuff. That we are the steward of some portion of God's glory that God has given to us to use to accomplish God's purposes. Everything we have belongs to God, but it has been placed into our charge and our care for us to use in accordance with God's values and God's vision and God's mission. Maybe you've heard someone say this phrase. This is a thing people sometimes talk about when they want to talk about Christian giving, and I get the idea. It's just wrong. Uh, the people will say things like this. They'll say, with everything you make, you should give a portion to God and the rest is yours to spend however you like. It's a nice idea, but it isn't what the Bible teaches. Um, The Bible, in fact, says no. All of it is God's. It's all God's. And God expects us to use what God has entrusted to us to glorify God. Jesus just teaches again and again what God puts in your hands, use for God's glory. So if God allows you the great joy of owning a truck, then God probably expects you to help some people move. That is the the spiritual burden on those people who own trucks, you know? If God gives you a house with extra rooms, God probably wants you to practice hospitality and let some people stay in those rooms. The stuff God has placed in your hands is for you to manage according to God's purposes, not your own. Again, I just want to say, I recognize how different this approach is than the one that our culture teaches us. But again, as we just talked about, that shouldn't surprise us. Whenever we're following Jesus, we should regularly expect to discover that we're being challenged to walk in a different direction. I know that some of us even right now, will be tempted to resist this invitation to change your mindset from the mindset of an owner to the mindset of a steward. I get that. Um, I, even as I preach it, I feel just a little scolded by my own sermon because I can think of plenty of times that I have used the wealth that God put into my hands for very selfish purposes, for purposes that had nothing to do with the call, glory, and purposes of God. I myself find myself a little scolded by the very sermon I'm preaching. But what I know is that this invitation to live as a steward, not an owner, is actually an invitation to joy. It's an invitation to peace. It's an invitation to security. Because if God is the one who owns everything, and if we are God's stewards, just called to manage what God puts in our hands for God's purposes and God's glory, then we get to live in absolute trust that God will provide what we need. And again, Jesus teaches this again. And as consistently as Jesus teaches that that we are not owners, that we are stewards, Jesus also teaches that we can trust the one who is the owner to provide our needs. Matthew chapter six, in a long section on 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 a very different approach to finances, you could go back and read Matthew six and just see Jesus talk for quite a bit about how to think differently about money and wealth. But in the middle of that, he says this, do not worry, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? 
These are the kinds of questions that owners ask. People who own stuff and have to get stuff so they have stuff ask these questions. It says, the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly father knows you need them. But then he gives you this, a glimpse of how a steward lives. It says, you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. That's the way a steward thinks. A steward seeks the reign and rule of their master. Seek my kingdom, seek my righteousness. You seek to live in accordance with my will, to be a faithful servant, and I'll make sure you have what you need. I have discovered as a matter of personal testimony, God and I don't always agree on what I need. I sometimes think I need more than God thinks I need. That has happened. But it has also happened the other way, that God has given me more than I thought I needed. God just says, you seek my kingdom, you seek my righteousness, and I'll make sure you have what you need. This principle is all over scripture. Like really, top to bottom, beginning to end, Old Testament, New Testament, this basic principle that when we live as stewards, God will provide our needs. In fact, the prophets often come to warn of the opposite, that if, we, if, we, if the people stop living as stewards, God will not provide their needs. Uh, Malachi 3, Malachi is talking to a situation where people have rejected the wisdom of God. And he says to them, you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. We're going to talk about what this, what this word tithe means, and we're going to talk about that a little bit next week. We're going to discover that the context of that verse is a little different than our context, and not every part of it, what Malachi says applies to us directly today. But the principle is sustained throughout the biblical text that when we live as obedient stewards, God is faithful to supply our needs. That principle is taught reliably. In fact, Paul invites us to pursue generosity to invite the blessing of God, trusting that as we are stewards with what God has given us, God will give us more to steward. He writes it this way. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, there's that promise from the owner again, that when we live as stewards, God will meet our needs. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's what stewards do. They have what they need to do the work God calls them to. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now the one who supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed, will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This is the consistent promise of God's word. God will meet your needs so that you can steward what God provides you for the good work that God has prepared for you to do. Now, I want to be careful. Every once in a while, you'll hear someone slightly exaggerate this promise and turn it into a false promise. Maybe on television, they'll say, if you give me money today, God will make you rich tomorrow. Obviously, exaggerations of that nature are inappropriate and unsupported by Scripture. But sometimes in our attempts to avoid that exaggeration, we fail to actually recognize the real amazing thing Scripture actually does promise. The real promise that's consistently given by Scripture, top to bottom, is that when we steward faithfully the resources God gives us, God will give us more to steward. Now, it isn't true that the more to steward God always gives us is more money. It's often more wisdom or more faith or more confidence or more hope. But the promise that God will give faithful stewards more to stewards so they can accomplish more for God's word and God's will in the world, that's a very consistent promise of Scripture. 
And when we hoard what God has given us, we actually cut ourselves off from the good work God was wanting to do through us. The next couple weeks, we're going to look at some of the specifics the Bible teaches about how we share our fries. Today, we're just kind of laying the groundwork about why. We share our fries because all the fries belong to God. And God is the one who gave us the fries in the first place. We share our fries because all the fries God gives us are ones we're meant to steward. To use the fries according to God's command for God's glory. We share our fries because when we're generous with our fries, we learn to trust that God meets our needs and God expands our opportunity for service. There's one last reason. It, it's for me the most important reason. In fact, personally for me, this is the reason that God most consistently uses to push my generosity one little step at a time. Like some of you, I am by nature a profoundly selfish person. But God is pushing me to be more generous all throughout my life. And this reason, this last reason, this is the one God most consistently uses. Why would we share our fries? Here's what you need to know. What you do with God's money that's in your hands will profoundly affect your relationship with God. This is the main reason I care about this is because this is a spiritual issue way before it's a financial issue. I think people pretend sometimes that they can grow in their spiritual walk and have it not affect what they do with their wealth. In fact, the Bible teaches just the opposite. That not only can't you grow in your spiritual walk without affecting your wealth, but that what you do with your wealth is a major catalyst for your relationship with God. I mean, it happened in the story, right? What could have been this amazing bonding between father and son over the biggest basket of McDonald's fries you ever saw as we munched fries together and laughed and giggled, instead became a break in our relationship. No, these are my fries. Get your own fries. I don't wanna share fries with you. And it was hard. Because in that moment, my kid loved his fries more than he loved his dad. I know it's not true in the big picture, but it's what it felt. Because I wanted some of those fries. And the same can happen with all the fries God's put in your life. When you live like an owner rather than a steward... When you say, these are my fries, your heart gets pulled away from God. It weakens your relationship with God when you live like an owner. When you live like a steward, God, these are your fries. And I'm going to use them the way you teach me. Your heart gets drawn toward God. It's like the rudder on a ship. You can steer your own heart by what decisions you make about the wealth God has given you. Here's how Paul puts it in a warning in 1 Timothy. He writes, those who want to get rich, that is to be the owner, right? Those who want to get the stuff and have it be their stuff, fall into temptation. It's a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul's saying, when you try to live as an owner, it will assuredly drag you away from God. You cannot maintain a strong relationship with your God and try to live as an owner of your stuff. It will pull you away. But you, man of God, flee from that. 
pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He's giving on a little bit. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth. Don't live like an owner because their wealth is so uncertain. If they're relying on their stuff, they're on shaky ground. But instead, put their hope in God. That's what stewards get to do, trusting that God will supply their needs. Put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Again, he's just listing all the things that the steward does when they manage God's money according to God's will. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul says your approach to your stuff is a rudder that steers your heart either toward God or away from God. In this teaching, Paul is just building on something that Jesus teaches. Back there in Matthew 6, I told you there's a long section on, um, on money and how those who are trying to follow Jesus should manage their money. We looked at the section about how where God provides our needs. A little earlier, though, in that same section, Jesus teaches us this. Do not store up for yourselves. There's this owner concept. Resist the owner notion. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he gives this principle, and you can see that this principle, this is what Paul was building off of in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. This is one of these simple biblical principles that's just true about humanity that so many of us misunderstand. Jesus doesn't say where your heart is, your treasure will be also. Once you care about something, you'll spend money on it. That might be true sometimes, I suppose, but that isn't what he says. He says the opposite. Where you put your treasure is what you're going to care about. If you invest your treasure in this life, you'll care about this life. If you invest all your money in the stock of some company, you're going to care intently about how that company does, aren't you? Right? All of a sudden, you'll, you've never paid attention before, but all of a sudden you'll care. You know, and go read the paper or look online and see how the stock price did this week. Jesus says our heart follows our treasure. This is the reason. This, is, this alone is the reason that about every two to three years, I just say we got to talk about this. It's because I know in my own spiritual life that I want my heart tied to God's. I want to grow closer to God every single day. And Jesus says, and Paul says, and over and over again, the Bible says that what we do with our wealth is a rudder. It steers. It's a steering wheel. For the heart. When you spend like a steward, you grow in love and relationship for the master who owns all the fries. When you spend like an owner, you grow in love with your fries. And the relationship with the provider of the fries breaks. In that moment, once I had my sermon illustration, I suddenly cared a lot more about having a fun day with my kid than I did about the perfect sermon illustration. And I couldn't quite figure out how to solve it because he really was not excited about sharing those fries. I was tempted to give him a big speech. Give him this speech, right? Give him the kid version of this sermon. I provided those fries. I bought for those fries. You will share those fries with me. I've given speeches like that before. My kids could tell you that would have been in character. But instead, I immediately went back up to the counter. And I bought a second. Did I already mention that McDonald's sells fries in baskets? I've mentioned this before. This is the the true amazement of this sermon. 
I bought a second basket of fries. And I came back and I set it on the table and I pulled his basket back and I mixed them up like this and I set them down. And by then we'd lost track of whose fries were whose. I don't want my heart to grow distant from God. Just like I didn't want that day to turn into a fight about french fries. Jesus wasn't quite done after he said the thing about where your treasure is, that's where your heart goes. He then said this, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. This master language, this is a reference to this stewardship concept, right? There can't be two masters. Either you're the master or you're the steward. Nobody can serve two masters. You you love one, hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. So, here's what I know. If you're going to follow Jesus in this world, you will often find yourself walking in a different direction than those around you. And that's true for lots of things. And it's true for what we do with our wealth. Everybody else is going to assume they're supposed to be an owner. That's what we are, owners. And the more you own, the better owner you are. And Jesus says, oh no, you're a steward. That's God's wealth in your hands to be used for God's glory. And when you do that, you'll find that God gets what God really wants, which is your heart. Weeks to come, we'll talk about the practicalities of what the Bible says to do. Right now, let's just offer God our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we want to belong to you. I mean, we know theologically that we do. That's what the Bible says. But we want to live like it. Like we belong to you. Like everything belongs to you. Live as your faithful stewards. So that as we are obedient to you, you would bind our hearts back to you. And we know, like we can even just see today, that the path of obedience is going to be a path of struggle and maybe disappointment and maybe some pain and some confusion, but we will walk it because that's the path that binds our hearts back to you. We give you our hearts, God. We give you our hearts in worship. We give you our hearts in stewardship. We give you our hearts in our song right now. Just receive the gift of ourselves. We pray all this in Jesus' name.